Introducing a Rick and Grace production. The Battles of the Civil War. Series entry number 19. The Siege of Petersburg. The Civil War was a distinguishing war in the United States history. Likewise, I thought it necessary to prepare a series of presentation thereupon. This particular presentation details the battle most closely connected with Lee's surrender at Potomax. Pomatox, excuse me. I present to you the Siege of Petersburg. The Siege of Petersburg took place from June 15, 1864 to March 25 of 1865 in Petersburg, Virginia, just south of Richmond. The Northern Generals, which we shall look at, are Ulysses S. Grant, Governor K. Warden, Ambrose Burnside, George Gordon Meade, William F. Smith, and Philip Sheridan. The most important Southern leader in the Siege of Petersburg was Robert E. Lee. Second, General P.G.T. Beauregard was a very happy man, for his initials actually stand for something contrary to popular belief. The initials P.G. and T stand for Pierre, Gustave, and Toutant, respectively. And lastly, we have William Mahone. Previous to Petersburg, the Union's main commander, Ulysses S. Grant, was driven away by Virginia native Robert E. Lee at the Battle of Cold Harbor. Having just lost 7,000 men in this battle before his retreat, he was desperate for victory. Now we had to gain the victory at Petersburg, a railroad center with four rails. Bringing supplies back and forth from Richmond, Petersburg was the perfect target. Grant made his way to Petersburg after tricking Lee by faking toward Richmond. By building a floating pontoon bridge 2,100 feet long in just eight hours, Grant and his men were able to make their way across the James River. Then Grant ordered his men to destroy the bridge. Lee had already known that once Grant crossed the river, it would all go downhill. He wrote to another general before Grant made it to the river. We must destroy this army of Grants before he gets to the James River. If he gets there, it will become a siege, and then it will be a mere question of time. When Grant arrived at Petersburg on June 15, Beauregard, the general of the Petersburg army, was caught by surprise. He managed to hold off Grant until June 18, however, when he finally managed to sneak a letter of help to Lee. At this time, Beauregard was greatly outnumbered, having only 14,000 men in comparison with Grant's 75,000. During the attack, a division commander named William F. Smith managed to break through nearly all defenses surrounding a small section of the city. The section of defensive line was not being guarded by Beauregard or his men, meaning that Smith could have simply marched right in. Nevertheless, Smith for unknown reasons decided to retreat, lengthening the battle by about nine months. Perhaps he imagined the possibility of a surprise counterattack. His mistake, no matter what the cause, was most likely responsible for the nine month siege to come. A few days later, Lee arrived with reinforcements. Grant, upon hearing of this disheartening occurrence, prepared for phase two the siege. The next day, June 20, 1864, was the beginning of the siege. Grant ordered his men to build trenches around the city. All the supplies from the trains were taken by Grant, and the Confederates in Petersburg were left scavenging for food. A notable general, George Gordon Meade, expressed his disgust for the siege by suggesting an aggressive attack upon all Confederate fortresses in sight. A commander under him replied in strict opposition, No, we are not going to charge. We are going to run toward the Confederate earthworks, and then we are going to run back. We have had enough of assaulting earthworks. After just one month, already 20,000 Union troops had been killed. General Governor K. Warren previously stated, For 30 days it has been one funeral procession past me, and it has been too much. Grant decided to dig more trenches for protection during attacks. Now we will rest the men and use the spade for protection until a new vein can be struck. Soon, after hearing from miners within his ranks, General Ambrose Burnside proposed tunneling beneath one of the Confederate's forts and blowing a giant hole in the ground. He suggested sending an infantry succeeding this to try and break through defenses while they were recovering from the sun. The tunnel took a month to build and was 500 feet long, dug 20 feet underground. Four tons of gunpowder and dynamite were packed beneath the earth. On July 30, at precisely 4.44 a.m., 
The gunpowder exploded with a thunderous roar, creating a 70 by 250 foot crater, 30 feet deep. The troops moved up before the dust settled. However, Brigadier General William Mahone quickly gathered Confederate troops for a counterattack, and 4,000 Union soldiers were slaughtered. Grant called it, The saddest affair I have witnessed in this war. Through the summer and autumn, Grant continued to attack the Richmond-Petersburg line, killing many Confederate soldiers and preventing any resources from reaching Petersburg. By the winter, Lee's army was starving. The state of the South towards the end of the siege was one of undeniable agony. Many began to desert and ammunition supplies were running out. The diet was one of utter disgust. As one soldier put it, his bacon was of, and I quote, a peculiarly scaly color, spotted like a half well case of smallpox, full of rancid odor, and utterly devoid of grease. By March, only 35,000 undernourished troops stood to Grant's large army of 124,000. On March 25, Lee decided to try a breakout towards Five Forks, a road junction covering the Southern Railroad. A federal counterattack wiped out all of Lee's initial gains. Four days later, Grant sent cavalry and infantry on a wide swing around Lee's right, attempting to pry the Confederates out of their defenses, bring them into their open territory, and settle the issue then and there. General Philip H. Sheridan's cavalry, with the help of the 5th Corps infantry, routed the Confederates at Five Forks. As the attackers surrounded their defenses, the Confederates surrendered. We are coming back to the Union, boys, one announced to his captors. Sheridan took 5,000 prisoners. On April 2, when Grant heard of the victory at Five Forks, he attacked the rest of the Confederates, trying to get them to surrender as well. At Fort Gregg, a few hundred Confederates hauled off 5,000 Union attackers, giving Lee just enough time to escape. Traveling westward, Lee hoped to join with Confederate forces in North Carolina. At this time, the Confederate government evacuated Richmond. Retreating Confederates set fire to warehouses and arsenals so Union soldiers couldn't use them. Looters helped themselves to unburned luxuries. A brisk south wind spread fires through the heart of the capital. The old war-scarred city seemed to prefer annihilation to conquest, someone said. At 7 o'clock a.m., April 3, the first Federals entered Richmond. The Union hoisted the American flag from a pole in the center of the city. Grant pursued Lee and sent a letter to Lee asking him to surrender. Lee would not give up. He fled to Appomattox, where he was surrounded on all sides by Grant. On Palm Sunday, April 9, a horseman came galloping at full speed with a message and a white towel, the flag of surrender. When the message was read, the men were so overjoyed that the war was pretty much over that tears developed in their eyes. This has been a Rick and Grace production. Thank you all for your attention.